So um, I'll be talking about mobile robotics. I think uh, so far we haven't heard about um, AI that is actually running around in the real world. So I'm quite excited to uh, start talking about that. And obviously, um, I don't want to spend too much time, but obviously there are quite exciting examples uh, these days that are uh, increasingly affecting our lives with uh, things we see in terms of space exploration, autonomous driving, um, robotic vacuum cleaning, and this is kind of what I've been mostly uh, working on in the past here, um, working with uh, small um, autonomous uh, drones like the one you can see there. Um, so, so let me um, start a little bit with questions that a mobile robot will have to ask itself. And some of these are probably quite uh, philosophical questions. It will have to ask itself, where am I and what does the world look like? And it is only after having found somewhat answers to these very first ones that it can then start doing anything uh, much more sophisticated, more kind of uh, AI type of things like what should I actually do and how should I uh, do that to accomplish something? So I will be talking about these two first questions because I think they are very important and are sometimes maybe a bit ignored uh, uh, these days, but I think they're very, very important in the context of um, mobile robotics. So this is a, a kind of traditional way of looking at uh, what is going on in a, in a mobile robot. So you see here the kind of outer world down there, and there will be some module inside the robot that performs some form of perception, pre-processing and things. Um, we'll then feed this processed data to a kind of module uh, labeled uh, state estimation and mapping. It might take into account some more sensing, some more like internal sensing, not just the sensing of the exterior world. And it is, it is then feeding that to the kind of higher level stuff, cognition, planning of motion, which is then in turn actually uh, translated into some form of motion control, which allows the robot to interact with the world. Again, change its position and the whole cycle repeats because the uh, appearance of the world actually changes and uh, uh, the context changes. So let me quickly introduce this whole topic of uh, sensing, um, of, of fusing also multiple sensor sources. So uh, we have heard something about vision just before, and I'm, I'm heavily um, involved in vision. I think it's a very exciting topic. But I want to emphasize that um, in a typical system, vision plays a very, very important part, uh, but it might not be the only one. So we typically want to add a higher robustness to your system by using also other cues. And this is exactly what's going on also in the human uh, localization and mapping system, right? So we are, we are having a, this uh, stereo vision system there, but uh, we are also combining that uh, with other cues that are coming from our vestibular system, which essentially is an inertial measurement unit. So you're measuring accelerations and rotation rates, which heavily aid your um, uh, capability of localizing yourself in a potentially unknown environment. So these, these sensor cues are somehow then fed into the brain uh, process. I have no idea how this is uh, being done, um, but probably some people know more than that. But the point is, at the end, you will have some idea of what the world looks like and where you are inside this world. And my point is that we do the very same thing with mobile robots. We're using uh, dedicated sensors like a stereo camera, like an inertial measurement unit you can see on here, and we are fusing such cues. Now in this, in this case, I know very well how this is being done. I'm afraid it's using a lot of math and lots of code, but I won't bore you with the details of that. I will uh, focus on some of the results here. But essentially the goal is very much the same. The sensing inputs are very much the same. Um, um, and the, the kind of task you want to achieve. Okay, so just very quickly, this is uh, our lab at Imperial College London that's just been recently established and uh, yeah. uh, we are the Dyson Robotics Lab, so we're obviously um, sponsored by, by Dyson in order to work also on, on things like robotic vacuum cleaners and beyond. Uh, it's uh, consisting of the PIs, Andrew Davison and myself, and we currently have a couple of postdocs and PhD students working in it. So let me um, start a little bit with uh, a historical overview of what's been going on in terms of 
vision-based localization and mapping in, a, in an unknown environment. So these are now purely vision-based algorithms that you can see here a kind of history. And back about 12 years ago, you would have the very first systems that could basically localize a monocular camera in a completely unknown environment that would then track somewhat salient points. You can see here these kind of salient points, kind of corners in the image. A uh, very sparse amount of, uh, of points, and at the same time reconstruct the orientation and position of the camera, at the same time as figuring out the 3D location of these uh, uh, points that are tracked in the image. And as time goes on, you could see uh, somewhat more sophisticated systems that could deal with a larger amount of points, like this one here, uh, all the way to the right side here where we could see very much dense representations that could be uh, established here. So here, this is, this is making, this is still a monocular camera only that could actually reconstruct a kind of very much dense volumetric representation of the environment. Um, but it was heavily making use of um, GPUs. So um, you can definitely see that the uh, uh, increase in processing power, along with also uh, better sensors, has enabled uh, a huge jump here in terms of representation of the environment, which can be very helpful for robotic tasks, right? So this is a, a quite impressively realistic representation of the environment here. It's, it's just still purely geometric, so there is no, no such thing as, as labeling yet and uh, understanding about what's actually here. It's just 3D coordinates and colors, and that's it, okay? So that was the vision side of things. Now I want to just very quickly run through um, uh, these kind of other senses because, again, I think it is very important to think about sensor fusion, to think about combining <laughs> different sensor sources. And in robotics, uh, robotic uh, autonomous cars, for instance, laser sensors have always been very popular because essentially they measure time of flight. They give you directly distances to things so you can just scan around and you directly get 3D points in the world. Whereas a traditional camera like this one here gives you only a projection of the, 2D, of the 3D world. Thus, it's very much more difficult to interpret as a sensor. Um, but we have other things that sense. Uh, this is now about sensing the exterior world, if you want. So we can sense the uh, 3D magnetic field. can be very interesting in the context also of flying systems here, measuring uh, air pressure, both dynamic and uh, static pressure, gives you huge amounts of information about uh, uh, um, your state and the exterior world. We have other things like, of course, GPS might solve all your problems at once. But uh, we are obviously trying to focus on problems where this might be unreliable, might uh, not actually be available like indoors, right, or in, in, in urban situations. We can measure various joint angles or wheel angles of the robot, very important information. Uh, we can measure with these tiny devices, uh, MEMS devices these days, quite small and cheap. We can measure directly rotation rate and acceleration. So this is, a, this is an IMU down here, okay. So these are uh, kind of traditional sensors, and I want to just quickly <laughs> highlight what the camera does here. So you see a 3D world in here, and then you can really think of a kind of image plane in front of a camera center, and these 3D points get projected onto this image plane. So this is the traditional way of, uh, of a very simple uh, camera model that we are using in our algorithms, right? So this is really what the camera does, a 3D to 2D projection. And the point here is that this tree here would generate the exact same image. So we have absolutely no means of distinguishing uh, these two situations. So we have this thing called uh, scale ambiguity. So if you're just using one camera, you have no, no way of resolving the whole scale of uh, how large your uh, environment is and where exactly you are in there. So it's only going to be known up to scale. Another reason for why it's a good idea to bring in other sensors. And uh, when we're talking about what we actually want to do, we want to figure out the robot state here on the left side. This is things like position, orientation, velocity, very important as well, somewhat sensory internal states that we want to figure out. And typically these things are time varying. Okay, so this is in a mobile robotic sense going to vary over time. On the other hand, if we're talking about the map, the environment, um, we have various ways of representing it. 
sparse 3D points or 3D point clouds, more dense kind of voxel grids and triangulated meshes, all kinds of ways of representing the geometry around us. So this is just very much geometric representations. Of course, you could think of much richer uh, uh, representations as well. But the point is, these are typically assumed to be uh, static. At least a large part of it has to be static in order to do anything. Because if you assume that everything could be moving, then you, you kind of uh, won't make progress in terms of figuring out where you are in your world. Um, so let me just quickly go back to my uh, PhD work, where essentially I was dealing with unmanned aerial systems and we were um, looking at applications like um, deploying them for disaster scenario management, getting overviews of a large uh, disaster scenario in order to deploy efficiently res rescue teams. We were also talking about uh, search and rescue applications, so finding people in, uh, in remote places with unmanned aerial systems. And I think this one is a very promising as well, uh, where we're doing uh, industrial inspection with aerial systems. Um, uh, in, in this case of this EU project, we were uh, uh, reconstructing a, a boiler of a, a power plant uh, in, a, in a fast way to, to, do, uh, uh, to kind of save time of inspection when it's shut down. Um, and this is, this is kind of my babies from my PhD time. Uh, we're doing uh, solar airplanes. Of course, it was a, a huge team. Um, we are trying to both push the limits in terms of flight times, really long flight times over several days <laughs> with this kind of larger airplane here, but at the same time also doing research in terms of the kind of localization and mapping in order to actually allow us to fly close to the ground and to solve a certain uh, application. So let me, let me quickly now dive into the visual inertial problem um, where in essence we are using these two sensors now. So I want to emphasize here that these, these two sensors are very much complementary in nature, okay? So the inertial measurement unit you see on the, on the left side there uh, is going to give you very good information in short term about how your motion has been performed. But over several hours, for instance, these kind of devices tell you absolutely nothing about how the relative uh, positions and orientations uh, of your robot will have been. On the other hand, the camera here is going to give you a totally different thing. If you look at two <coughs> pictures, they could, be, could have been taken at, uh, I don't know, hours apart, doesn't matter, right? But what, what this really gives you is spatial correlation. So um, by identifying corresponding points in this case, across the two images, you will have an idea about how these are spatially uh, oriented and located with respect to each other. And the fusion of those two together give you incredibly strong uh, and very robust uh, information. All right, so this is just a, a bit more uh, schematic view of things. So what we're trying to do here in this, in this problem is we're trying to find these uh, camera poses, these are camera frustums here, and we are trying to also guess the 3D locations of these points uh, such that these detected points that we have associated with the 3D points, that, uh, that all of this matches up and makes sense somehow, right? So we're trying to do reconstruction of the world here in terms of 3D positions of these points and reconstruction of the cameras relative to each other and relative to the world. And now the point is, for this in, uh, to run on a mobile robot, you really need to do all of this in real time, okay? Real time matters. It needs to be accurate enough such that you can actually do anything afterwards. And it also needs to be robust, okay? We, we have talked about um, uh, robustness before in, in other talks. So here the point is, this is running something like 20 hertz, okay? Over days. So you, you really can't get away with this running 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time. It's not good enough. It has to really always run. It has to always, it has to always work. So robustness is a very, very important point here. All right. And so this is a, a, just a, a quick overview of something that, uh, that we have developed, uh, a kind of very tightly integrated uh, visual inertial fusion, which would essentially here, you could use two cameras, could also use only one camera plus the IMU, 
okay? And the kind of thing that we, we get here, we're just uh, taking around the camera through a building, so you'll get the reconstruction of the trajectory that we, we've taken, as well as a, a kind of sparse uh, environment map, all right? And uh, just to give you an idea of the scale, so this is the <laughs> 10 meters here, we're using a nonlinear optimization scheme here, still we're operating at real time. And um, this is a couple of hundred meters walking around back and forth, and in the end, it's still somewhat uh, consistent. The point is, though, you will, you will accumulate some drift when you're, when you're do doing that. So this is a still quite dumb system. It wouldn't do any corrections from when it, when it came back to a, to, to a point where it was before. Okay, I'll just quickly show you this whole thing in operation. Essentially, here we had this. Uh, oh, this is not playing. <coughs> well, that's really a pity. Okay, I will. Uh, I'll skip it, maybe come back later. Um, I just quickly want to uh, make the point back to um, where I started in terms of uh, flying systems. We're then uh, applying this also to uh, solar airplanes. So you can see here kind of aerial views that we get. All right. And I really hope that this one works. Ah, this one works, okay. So this is essentially now deployed to, to run on board this uh, uh, small aerial system. And you can see here somewhat uh, the camera and I new set up over there. And the, the pilot would here only give very high level uh, position and orientation inputs. And the thing has to figure out its, its location uh, inside the world, You're obviously not using any GPS and stuff. It has to also cope with things like repeated structure or repeated texture here, uh, moving obstacles around here. This must not uh, fail the whole system. It's not very exciting, I know, but once you have, once you have this uh, thing uh, running like that, you can start doing the, the cooler stuff, the kind of uh, more artificial intelligence kind of uh, uh, things. Okay, and here this is somewhat uh, as close to a real application as we got. Essentially, you can see the same system that we deployed inside a gold mine. So this is 2,000 meters uh, below sea level, I think, even. Uh, so definitely no GPS here, okay? And we were using this uh, visual inertial system. We are enlightening somewhat the, uh, um, the outer world. Uh, sorry, it's playing somewhat slow. But essentially, you could get a reconstruction of this uh, kind of pause here in uh, more or less real time that you can see over there on the right side, uh, somewhat slowly. Uh, so here we're also using a laser scanner and just overlay the kind of laser scans in order to get a really quick, somewhat dense representation of the environment. Okay. So I want to end with uh, this last example that is really now from uh, uh, the lab here at Imperial College, where essentially we're using this um, Kinect-like sensor. So this is now not, not just a, a camera, this is a, a 3D uh, RGBD camera, so you also get depth along with the colored image. Um, and we're using this to, to create um, quite dense and very much consistent representations of, uh, of, of an environment. Um, <coughs> very recent work, uh, I have to say here. And what we're doing, again, it's a kind of dense uh, mapping system. OK, can I press the button? OK, it's playing. Um, so we're using this Kinect uh, uh, camera. And this allows us to, to reconstruct these type of uh, very dense maps in a consistent way. So I think that's the novelty here, that it is consistent. It actually detects when it's drifted um, over space and time, and then it applies these deformations all the time. Uh, so it detects uh, revisited areas, and it makes corrections. And now you can see 
right now how it snapped back into place. And it would do this over and over again, also kind of invisible kind of micro corrections that it does all the time. And this is really what allows us to build uh, a very much consistent uh, a map. And again, I have to emphasize this is working in real time. It's doing this kind of very dense map deformation. So there's quite, a, quite some challenge in, in, in doing that actually in real time. It's using heavily cheap use. Uh, I have to admit at this point, but still we can process 20 hertz and can map out uh, uh, an area like that. I think that's just a little bit of an overview of what's happening. So, yeah, basically on the, on the bottom uh, left there, you can see the raw data from the sensor, the color image and the depth image, and then the reconstruction in the middle. And here we're basically separating a kind of old part and an active part, and then try to bring them together and kind of stitch them together and deform uh, uh, the, the whole map. Like that's what's happened here. and a bit a larger one here. So we have to be able to, to detect these quite large uh, drifts, potentially. We can, also, we can also close loops that go over several hundreds of meters where we have uh, quite substantial uh, error that's accumulated. Okay. But I think I'll stop here. It is exciting times for vision-based robot localization and mapping. We have a suite of new sensors and processors that are becoming available uh, and that drive design of, of new algorithms. And we have, well, we have not seen, but I hope really to, to be able to show that afterwards in the, in the break, that we have uh, very much dense um, mac mapping systems uh, that are capable of doing that in real time. I want to emphasize that efficiency, accuracy, and robustness are key to all of that. And that there's still a lot to do uh, on the way forward in order to get uh, truly intelligent robots and AI. Of course, we have to deploy this stuff on real platforms. We have to talk about richer maps, geometric primitives, object recognition, dynamic content in the whole story. And um, we have to also, um, at some point, talk about scene understanding through interaction because I do think that these, these things are not just separate. You can't just see this cycle as a kind of pipeline of input is a geometric map and then you do stuff. I think this should be somewhat uh, all linked together in a properly intelligent system. So thanks a lot for your attention and really sorry for the technical problems that we had here. Okay, thank you.